A reading from Nightmare Factory, Nightmare Fuel, fanfiction.net. The clock tower struck the hour, and the chime echoed through the corridors of the church once, twice, three times. As it beat out its song of seven o'clock, the sunset filtered in through stained glass casting a myriad of colours about the room in scattered patches of light, pouring over her world. And Imai stood poised, the corpse of the man at her feet, blood oozing from the wound in his chest. She clutched the knife, its blade dripping with crimson streams of that life-giving juice. And her other hand, flung up over her mouth, to keep her from screaming from her conflicted emotions, as they bottled up briefly inside her. Tears flowed over her fingers. Her knuckles against the handle of the instrument of murder turned white from all those feelings. Crayol placed a heavy hand on her shoulder, initially glad it had been her, not him, whom had taken the man's life. Though he still wiped the corner of his mouth clean of the blood, it had leaked from his earlier endeavour to keep himself safe. It was him or us, he said simply. The knife clattered to the floor beside its victim. Imai's head tilting back as her eyes trailed the ceiling and her hands fell to her side. This is bullshit, she finally shouted, fist clenching in her rage. Just come out already, stupid coward. I'm so sick of this and sick of you. An audible chuckle filtered through their heads as the game master laughed at their plight uncaring about what they'd had to do in order to obtain Ime's wish. Forty-eight whole years were riding on this, and he very well knew that it could possibly put Ime's life at an end, if she were fated for it. Sure, maybe he didn't know exactly when her life would be ending, but he was sure that with such a reckless personality, it couldn't be too long. And forty-eight years was a long time for a girl whom was no longer a child. Imai, calm down. Freaking out isn't going to help a thing. He's dead, gone. Crayle's head suddenly snapped to the side as she wheeled around and slapped him across the face. It's not your father who's dead on the floor, Crayle, she said, and clamped her hand over her mouth again, holding back her flood of tears as best she could. His head slowly righted itself, eyes casting over her, watching her anguish. Weary. We don't know that it wasn't fake, Creel tried, as she started to walk down the aisles in between the pews. He followed her, caught up to her, and stopped her by placing his hand on the back of her shoulder. She froze, and he drew her back into a hug. Her emotions, so roiled now, that she didn't even notice the touch for a few seconds. When the problem started up, she wriggled free of him, and sighed heavily, sniffing. She was cute when she cried, Crayle noted, and ran a hand through his hair. I don't care if he was fake or not. That was just... He got it, surely being attacked by a masked man that only later, after you'd murdered him, turned out to be your own father. It was a brilliant ploy by the game master, but still... They didn't know it wasn't a ruse. He'd brought a dog into the game, but could he really do something so cruel? He supposed half of the fun for fire was to watch them squirm, trying to figure it out. After all, it wouldn't be a game if it wasn't so challenging, would it? Before she'd had much longer to grieve or suck it up, they felt a shift, as though the world were suddenly different. Oh no, Crayol uttered and shut his eyes tight. Next challenge, the game must have cried, and again they were taken somewhere else. They would be given an entirely different task to complete, and the horror of the last stage they'd come through would wash away the problems they now faced. When Crayol opened his eyes, they were in a bathroom. Emai had taken to clutching his arm out of fear, but now she let go and they were both blinking at their surroundings. What could they possibly be told to do here? 
Crail grabbed Imai's hand and dragged her out of the bathroom. They stepped into darkness, the darkness of a tunnel and what looked to be a subway station, its musty scent flooding their nostrils as they exited the equally pungent bathroom. One light hung, gently swaying back and forth as it spluttered for life, gracing the middle of the platform with on and off flashes of vibrant light and solid blackness periodically. Imai felt a chill run up her spine. She had a legitimate fear of places like this. Bad things always happened in places like this. Bored, sounded the voice of the games master, booming into their heads. The subway, when you do, ride it all the way to its destination. The command sounded easy, but in that instant the subway flew by, its long cars rattling on the rails as it shot past at full speed. It hadn't even stopped at the platform. How the fuck am I wondered? And about a minute later, as they shuffled together towards the edge of the platform, Crayle's nose was nearly taken off as the thing flew by again, prompting him to wheel back into his heels, his arms rotating to keep himself from falling over. Imai sniffed and wiped her eyes again, her mind no longer in the image of her father slain before her. Instead, she was now trying to wrap her head around the idea of either stopping a train or boarding one going sixty miles an hour. Is that the same train? Crayol asked the game master, who confirmed his suspicions. It will pass on by on the minute, every minute, until you board it. Tick tock, time's a wasting. If there was a time when Emai wanted to take a flamethrower to that beautiful voice, it was now. What are we going to do? she asked Crayle, and he turned to her, smirking. Let's just say you're lucky you picked me out of all people to be here. She thought about it for a second and then nodded. Of course, they could use Crayle's summoning ability to teleport themselves onto the train. But that begged the question... How would they get something on the train with a drawing of themselves? They both started looking around for anything they could use. Imai pointed out the cluster of cement that had broken free from one of the pillars by some unknown impact and fetched two of them for their use. It didn't take long for Crayle to scribble some doodles into the chunks of stone. Imai was searching for something else. What, you don't think this will do? Crayle asked and she shook her head at him. That's not going to break the glass. They'll just bounce off. That stuff's really strong, you know. He figured she had a good point. The train cars whizzed by again. The gentleman with light lilac hair and yellow-green eyes is called Fire. He's a games master. And he has the voice of a demon. The most exquisite voice. The one with robin egg blue hair is called Crayle. And the pink noodle, <laughs> she's called Imai. The train cars whizzed by again. Imai was standing at the end of the platform and she poked her head down the tunnel having to stare long enough that her eyes adjusted to the light, using a hand to block out the rapid flashing of the one light they had to go by. In the tunnel she could see some piping on the wall. It looked rusted. Got it, she explained. But she knew how dangerous this would be. You're going to have to go out there, she said, pointing down the tunnel to Creole, whose face immediately wound up in reluctance. To him, the whole proposal sounded like suicide. There's a pipe. There's a pipe that you should be able to yank off that wall. Unless you're telling me you've got little girl's arms. She cocked her eyebrow at him and he frowned back. I do not have little girl's arms, came his response. And he handed her the stones. One with a doodle of her face and one with his. He'd at least be smart about it. If he really had to do this... And he stood right at the corner, 
the furthest point to the pipe, and waited until the subway passed again, the movement of Ur requiring he hold down his hat to keep it from blowing off his head. The split second the carriage passed his face, he rushed down the tunnel, but his eyes hadn't quite adjusted quickly, and for a few seconds he glanced about. When he finally spotted the pipe, he began sprinting up to it and frantically began attempting to yank it out of place, placing his foot on the wall for extra leverage. It was a stubborn piece of plumbing. However, it wasn't going to be long before he could see the headlights of the train coming down the tunnel once more. He gritted his teeth and pulled as hard as he could, the rust allowing it to yield slightly quicker as it bent towards him. Hurry, Imai shouted at him, and when the pipe finally gave way, there was a loud crack, and he dashed for the platform. As the train rushed towards him, his body strained, and he jumped for Imai's extended hand, his toe flinging into the wall as the train barely caught the edge of his shoe, pain filling his foot as he slammed into the concrete. Ah, oh, fuck, he swore, cutting his curse short as he brought his foot closer to him, nursing it gingerly. He let the pipe sit next to him. By now, it had been a fair amount of time, and they need not waste any more of it. Imai knew there had to be something on that train if they were to ride it to the destination to complete the challenge. While Crail continued rubbing his foot, she took the pipe to the tracks, and the next time it flew by, she swung at it the sound of shattered glass cascading about the platform, and she looked after the train, trying to guess which window she'd managed to break. The next time the train passed, she tossed her stone at it, but missed due to the train's speed, and it bounced off. Crayle sighed, and got up from where he was, limping over. You have to lead the target, he stated, ever clever, and stood poised, waiting for his chance. Which window, he asked. Before he'd even had a chance to get an answer out of Imai, she was throwing her rock, doing as he'd said as the train suddenly sped by again, and this time she nailed it. Well done, I guess, he stated, and she stuck a tongue out at him. I don't have little girly arms like you do, pipe boy, she shot, and he just smirked, hand in pocket, as he handed her his stone. At least she made it easy for the second one to get in there. She took the stone from him, the small, cute little drawing of Crayol giving her a bit of a smile for a moment as she looked at it. Oh, he's as cute as you are, wimpy man, she teased, and he pinched the brow of his nose. Export, princess, cashew, location, train, car three, he said, and she was gone. Inside the car, she dropped his stone. Export, Crayola, A Royale, location, train, car three. When he arrived in the train, Imai was waiting for him, sitting on one of the seats. He sat down beside her and looked out of the window. Boring concrete. I wonder how long we'll have to ride this thing, Imai thought to herself, and he shrugged. Until it arrives at its destination, he quoted, and they both sighed simultaneously, and both were equally surprised when the lights shut off with a sudden noise. And then came a second sound of metal being wrought to the desire of some being forcing it out of place. Looking up, they could see three equally long, straight holes carved into the top of the train car. Let's get the hell out of here, e my spot, and Crayol agreed, their way being lit only by the flashing of lights as they passed them into the tunnel. The clacking beneath from the wheels and the metal rails accompanied only by the clacking of claws of whatever creature was after them next. But when they got into the next car, the sound stopped, and they both looked around. Do you see it? Creole asked, and Ima responded negatively, prompting him to raise his marker in case he needed to use it. Ima brandished the pipe. When opposite them began to open, they both stepped back on the threshold between their original entry point and the one now being violated by whatever it was. But to their surprise, the lights went back on and in stepped a little girl. Her large, round eyes 
held the joy of being young. Her golden pigtails dangled as she skipped slowly towards them. Humming, she clutched in her arms a small teddy bear, missing an eye, and as she moved, she released it, dragging it behind her across the floor of the train. Hi, I'm Lucy, she called to them, stopping a few feet in front of them. Emai's jaw had already dropped as she stirred, completely disgusted. I don't trust it. It's blue, she said, clutching at Creole's shirt, referring to the fact that the dress the little girl wore was certainly blue, but Creole's flat face as he glanced back at her told her he wasn't buying that. I'm blue, he reminded her, and unlatched her claw from his wardrobe, stepping towards the girl and taking a knee. Hey, Lucy, what are you doing here? There's a scary monster out there, you know. He pointed up towards emptiness. My mummy once told me. My mummy once told me there was a monster inside all of us, she replied, and his eye twitched. Jeez, that was dark. She swayed back and forth on her feet. Emai's unamused gaze followed her every move as she resisted the urge to punch a child for just wearing a dress. Where's your mummy? he asked, and she giggled at him. Too adorable, really, as she batted those long eyelashes. In my tummy, she said, and if Emai's jaw had dropped hard before, it practically hit the floor now. She gestured with both hands like she was signalling a plane down the runway, pointing with them over and over at this girl, whom she couldn't even believe was allowed to stand this close to them at this point. Yeah? Creole asked. I'm going to take that as a bad sign. Just as he finished, the girl's eyes changed, slowly turning white to red. Her pupils became slits, and they both dropped back a few paces as her skin began to bulge in some places. Her flesh and dress tore at her waist. Her eyes rolled back into her skull, and her jaw opened impossibly wide, splitting skin, tearing tendon. They heard the crack of bone, the snapping of joints, a loud crack, as suddenly the little girl's knees reversed, her limbs elongated, her hands formed vicious claws. A long, snake-like tongue slithered between rapidly sharpening teeth. Run! Creole shouted and grabbed Ime's hand, past the monster and towards the next train car. She trusted his judgment, knowing he could think quickly on his feet, and they entered the next room. He slammed the door shut and locked it with a massive latch. He only said we had to get to our destination, so if that holds it, we're in the clear. There was only one problem, and Emai remembered it quite well. Its claws could pierce through the solid steel of the external shell of the car. They heard a loud screech coming from the beast, and the sound of four limbs climbing across the train cars in rapid, pounding beats, slamming out the rhythm most sour as Emai held up the pipe. I've got a pretty stupid idea, but it might work, Crayol explained, and Emai nodded. You better hope you do. I don't think the shite's gonna stop any time soon. There was a gut-wrenching tearing sound as the thing clawed at the roof, making those same marks as before. She smacked its talons with the pipe, trying to dislodge it. She couldn't tell if it had any effect. Remind me when this is over. I'm giving fire a hell bait of a swirly, Emai said angrily. Even using his term for her swear word, Creole grinned. It was rubbing off on her. Oh, that's rich, considering, came Fire's voice. And Ime shouted noises of frustration at him. What's that supposed to mean? I mean to say, the crafty siren mentioned, that your outfit makes you look like you belong in a toilet. Her rage was imminent as she slammed her pipe repeatedly against the side of the train car. Despite all the chaos, this garnered a stifled chuckle from Creole, and she waved the pipe his way menacingly. Don't you start with me, girly boy. That ended his laugh, and he went back to drawing on the wall as he had been. 
It was a picture of the girl they'd just seen, the one that was now attempting to tear the roof off as Ime fervently fought it off with the swats of a tiny metal pipe. When there was finally a hole rendered in the roof, big enough for it to get its arm inside, they were both forced to hide behind the seats of a car as it swiped about, trying to cut into their miserable flesh, draw their blood. Wait until it's in, and then get ready. He finished his drawing and ran towards her, narrowly dodging a swipe from that massive talon as he crashed into the wall. He felt something wet on his cheek, and then a sting. Evidently it had barely missed his head, but cut his cheek. He ducked into the booth with Ime, who was looking around as they heard the skittering over the top again. It was moving. Suddenly a window burst in with a swipe of a claw. It took out the guard between another window, smashing that one in the process as well. The whole car shook as it swung its grotesque body inside, pulsating flesh, bending unnaturally as the monster entered. It was nowhere near a little girl any more. Aside from the massive claws, it looked more like a spider, crawling and backwards knees and arms, the face of the little girl upside down in a perpetual scream against its own flesh, snaking, tongued, lapping against its nose and face as it dribbled saliva down its own forehead, which was serving more like a chin now. Emai made a face of disgust and choked down a gag. Now was the cue. Export Princess Cashew location. Train car three, he shouted, and Emai vanished. He rolled out of the way of the next attack, the monster, Lucy, smashed the entire seat they had been behind. It rampaged in a circle as he dipped between its legs to the other side of the train car. Export Crayola, A Royale, location, train car three, and he was gone. Back in their entry points, the stones sat in their original landing spots, and for a moment they both breathed, just breathed. Leaning into their seats, still the train rattled on. How long is this goddamn train ride? Imai shouted in frustration. Almost there, came a response, unamused from fire, and they both pressed their palms to their faces. Yeah, super helpful shite for brains, Imai tensed as they heard Lucy moving about the train again, trying to figure out where they'd gone. They heard the sound of shattering glass and the lights flickered with a massive lurch of the train. For a moment, things went silent, and they heard a voice trail over the quiet. I just want to play, came Lucy's little voice, and Crayol shivered. Damn it, kids always got to him. That bastard game master probably knew that, though. I hope your wish was worth it, princess. There came a crash and the door car exploded inwards, flying into the back of itself and causing their ears to ring slightly with the resonance of metal on metal. The abomination flung itself inside and immediately began to tear the place up as they hid, slashing into every single one of the seats, one by one. Luckily they had a bit of time. Crayol exhaled slowly, focusing his abilities just as it found them and Crayle coughed up a thick load of blood, tasting its tangy metallic flavour as he leapt up. Import, Lucy, location, train car one, he shouted, and the monster vanished slowly as he strained visibly, sweat running down his brow. The massive thing disappeared, and he fell to his knees. Light suddenly burst from all around them as the train breached the tunnels. Just as that happened, the train brakes began to screech loudly, and Imai covered her ears while Creole simply wiped at his mouth. As the train pulled to a stop, they both breathed a sigh of relief, and the doors on the side opened. Out they walked, and they stepped into a field of flowers. The roses and daisies and sunflowers flowed in an endless sea in all directions. They'd made it. Congratulations the game master said to them, and they heard a gentle, slow clap as he did so. On to the next challenge. Thanks for